Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Justine Kalma. I am a science reporter at The Verge. Uh, we cover science and technology, and my reporting looks specifically at uh, climate change and the environment. Uh, I also have a, a focus on environmental justice and equity. So I'm really excited for our discussion today on equitable recovery for public spaces and city planning. We have some fantastic panelists. Uh, and so uh, we can start with some introductions so that you all can get to know each of our panelists a little bit and, uh, and the great work that they're doing. Uh, so I'll start off by um, introducing uh, Catherine Lusk who is the executive director of the Initiative on Cities at Boston University, where she spearheads university-wide programs and urban research. And I will hand it over to Catherine to, to tell us a little bit more about herself and her work. Hi, thank you so much, Justine. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, as Justine mentioned, I serve as the co-director and founding executive director of the Boston University Initiative on Cities. We are a university-wide research center at BU. So I have the pleasure and privilege of working with faculty in the social, natural, and computational sciences, as well as in public health. And we seek to catalyze research in, on, and with cities in pursuit of uh, sustainable, just, and inclusive urban transformation. We also create experiential learning opportunities for students and connect them to um, uh, internships and uh, course-based work in cities. And I'll, I'll end by saying we were actually co-founded now many years ago by the late mayor of Boston, Tom Menino. So one of the major projects that we spearhead is the Menino Survey of Mayors. And we have the pleasure of interviewing over 100 mayors across the country every summer. I'll talk about some of those findings today, even though we're in the field right now and about halfway through our interviews, but we've learned a lot about how mayors approach equity, equity in the public realm, and a lot of the challenges that they're facing as we not emerge from the pandemic, uh, but as we try to look down the road beyond it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. And then next we have Christian Bannister, uh, who is a Digital Experience Design Director director at Gensler. Uh, Christian has been conceptualizing, designing, and developing award-winning interactive experiences for more than 20 years, and I will uh, throw it over to, to Christian. Great, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so I think um, you sort of stole a little of my thunder there, but <laughs> I'll pick it up. Yeah, so I, I um, work with Gensler, and we, I work with the DXD team, and really what we do is we work at the intersection of people, place, and technology. So it's really about integrating technology and really kind of finding opportunities to integrate content and data into the built environment. Um, we're we're currently, I should mention, we're currently matching a grant uh, with the Knight Foundation for a project called Urban Periscope, where really the goal is to increase awareness of, of, of data for um, civic engagement. Really, it's to sort of like, um, kind of really onboard citizens to the potential of data by allowing them to get their hands dirty in a playful augmented reality uh, experience that we're sort of um, integrating into the urban uh, experience. And that's been really interesting and um, exciting for us to kind of you know push new technology and these new opportunities to connect with people and really get them excited about data and what's possible. So this is really uh, what I'm bringing today. Um, hopefully we can talk about it more. Thank you, Christian. We will talk about it a, a, a lot more, I'm sure, during uh, our discussion. And then we have um, Melissa Gaston, who is the co-founder and executive director of the North End Community Coalition in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Melissa is a community organizer and also a realtor with, with her own firm. And I'm really excited to, to introduce uh, Melissa Gaston. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Thank you very much, Justine. Um, I am the co-founder and the executive director for the North End Community Coalition. And here in the North End, uh, we're just about a mile and a half outside of the city of Charlotte, um, but we are trying to bridge the digital divide and connect our residents with the resources that are out here and available just to make their, their lives a little easier. Um, definitely on the ground, working with the community, connecting them to all kinds of resources and people and just um, being in the trenches, as I like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love that you're you're in the trenches. Um, hopefully you can um, bring that view into our, our conversation and we can kind of join you there as we dive into uh, discussing equitable recovery. Um, you know, the first 
first things first, um, I wanted to ask how you all have seen the pandemic exacerbate existing mm -hmm. inequities um, or create new ones, um, and how you know how how can we then address those inequities? So I, I'll be glad to go first and answer that question. For us, um, because of our location where we are and the demographics um, and the economic status of a majority of our residents, the the pandemic had a dramatic effect on our residents. Um, things that some of us took for granted, like internet access, just being able to have a safe place to be and, and stay away from the COVID and, and things like that. Um, it just, things we took for granted. So as an example, um, residents who didn't have access for internet, they couldn't do a telemed visit. They couldn't help their children connect to school. So if your children are already struggling with school for whatever reason, and then you don't have access to get to the technology that just really showed um, how much that had an impact on it, things you don't think about. And it created even greater isolation for our residents as well. Um, if you have technology, you can you know Zoom or FaceTime with somebody, but if you don't have that access, Access, that also creates additional isolation. So they're already telling you to stay in your house and stay safe, but you can't even connect with your friends and neighbors and relatives um, because of that isolation. So it really um, had a, a demonstrative um, impact on us. Thank you so much for sharing, Melissa. It's really, it really hits home uh, for Gensler. I mean, we do a lot of design for workplace and it really has been sort of an, an inequitable sort of um, kind of experience for people in different demographics sort of adjusting to this hybrid, this hybrid reality of the new workplace that we're sort of promoting. And for certain clients, like we have a lot of clients that are tech companies, we work with Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, it's, it's sort of a different situation for some of those people who have a lot of space, a lot of income, they're highly, con you know, their connectivity is good, they have all the technology set up. But then there's like other people who are living in crowded crowded homes that just really don't have the space to be able to sort of realize that dream of the hybrid workplace. Mm -hmm. And it's that's been really interesting for us because, you know, we design the spaces, but we haven't always like been designing for people's homes. So it's like, an, it's an extension of an architecture that we've always that we've been considering for years, which is fascinating and sort of a new, I guess, epiphany for our team. Yeah, and I, I think I would say, <laughs> There was going into and then and then emerging from the pandemic, right? So there were inequities in place and um, and elements of the the sort of infrastructure of, of cities that was seriously eroded at the beginning of this this sort of time period we're living in. So in in all the years of surveying mayors, we've sort of found that they talk about kind of the three legs of the stool of what makes a, a vibrant city, right? And so you want sort of um, healthy physical infrastructure transit, housing, bridges, um, schools, you want healthy and thriving fiscal infrastructure, meaning is this, are the city's finances healthy? Do they have good bond rating? Can they get access to capital? Is the economy diverse? Um, you know, can businesses, new, new businesses sort of open and operate and thrive? And then they talk about social infrastructure, right? So they talk about our people, the people that make a place sort of as wonderful as it can be, are people actually thriving? Are they healthy? Can they live up to their full potential? Is there some degree of social cohesion? And if you look at all three of those, some were broken before, infrastructure, physical infrastructure was broken before, but I think social infrastructure and sort of fiscal infrastructure in cities has really eroded or corroded, both because of the pandemic and because of systemic racial injustice that has been just um, part and parcel of the urban experience and the sort of American experience for decades. And so, you know, when we talk about when we talk about cities, we sort of look at all three. And because you both made such great points, um, I want to like tease with a little close by sort of teasing with a little point that's come out of the Menino survey so far with our interviews with mayors this summer. We're asking them what are the long term consequences of the pandemic that most worry them. And we've only done about half of our interviews, but two things are rising to the top. One is um, uh, learning loss among kids, right? That was inequitable going into the pandemic and it's gotten worse for communities of color and lower income communities. And the second is mental health and trauma. It was inequitable going into the pandemic and it's worse as this endures and as racial injustice endures. And the overlap with the points that, um, you know, that you guys have been talking about are, um, are, are both relate to broadband and the digital divide because telehealth is one way you can serve and support communities with, in addressing mental health. 
And it's another way that's really critical to closing um, educational gaps. And then the other one is, you know, because we have researchers that do work on the educational divide and do work on um, telehealth and mental health. And the physical environment people are in mm -hmm. adversely impacts sort of outcomes in both of those areas. So can you get access to it? And can you be in a space that's private, that's quiet, um, you know, that's actually health promoting and that's conducive to learning while we're all having to uh, endure sort of being at home and um, uh, and, and having to endure the, the sort of exclusion from the normal settings where we would work and we would get access to healthcare and we would learn. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, I am curious to what, if any opportunity, uh, you know, a uh, quote unquote new normal might bring, you know, from here, what do we do to address these, all these inequities? It's a tough question, I know. Everyone's working on it. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, I mean, I think it, but it's, uh, you know, for, I mean, I'm gonna go back to the project we're working on tonight because I wanna talk about that. And I, I, I mean, so we're kind of going back to civic engagement and we wanna get people to really lean in on shaping their world. And I think that's something that, you know, that we've been, you know, we feel really strongly, but we understand there is a digital divide and there's a, a lot of inequity that's just kind of systemic and part of our society. But at the same time, we think there's like value in getting people to really um, sort of hold their leadership accountable, really add some transparency to data, the way that funds are allocated to really get people thinking about that, but not in just a way where they're sort of consuming graphs and diagrams and insights that have been sort of spread distributed in more of an editorial way or a part of like a, and it, here's my insight it supports my research this is something i want to tell you we want to get people slicing and dicing the data getting dating you know making developing their own insights and validating it on their own and then and then really amplifying their own ideas and i know this it requires social media but it, we think that that is like a, a way to sort of kind of facilitate these conversations that are more open. So I guess in a way it's really optimistic, you know, because, you know, we believe that the social media or the people being connected to the internet can ultimately benefit everyone. But, you know, obviously there's been a lot of issues with that. when we look at what's happened in, you know, uh, the last couple of election cycles and just the way that things, the way that sort of social media has been misfiring and misinformation, fake news, a lot of things that are happening right now are so sort of the, kind of the, the, those are negative outcomes, but I guess we're still working towards um, some positive ideas. I guess I, I guess we're still very optimistic about connectivity, the internet and empowering people with usage of data. So that's something that we're doing right now. I mean, it's, you know, and uh, I don't know, that's a few thoughts there. So um, I'll jump in right here. For us and our community and our coalition, we've been, kind of going back to the basics. I agree, you know, social media and having the data is very important, but we just need to get to the basics so people can at least connect to the internet so they can have the, um, to be able to share their information or even to be able to share their data. Um, if you don't have that connection and you're not going to people's houses or you're not having these big community meetings where people are able to engage, you're really isolating people and they're not able to provide the data that's needed and the data that they have um, is very important to change what's happened and to improve what's happened in the past and keep developing and going on. So um, one of the things that you know really struck me during the whole pandemic thing, so some kids were able to connect to the internet because they had a device, the school gave them a device, whatever, but they weren't necessarily familiar with it because it wasn't like they had computers in their home all the time or they just used them at school. But the person who was at their house trying to help them may have been an elderly person, you know, a grandparent or an older parent who did not know how to use that computer or better yet, their parents were the healthcare workers or, you know, the people that had to go to work. They didn't have a choice to stay home. So their kids are home by themselves trying to connect to the internet. They can't connect or they're having difficulties or they're doing what kids do. I don't want to do schoolwork, but, and so right. that's a whole missing thing. So there's definitely that, um, that aspect as well. So I, I just don't know how we can come together and collect the data and, and do those things so we can improve upon it without connecting to the people. We have to figure out a way to connect to the people and really be able to institute change that's gonna be effective for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It's a great point. There, there are some, you know, the, the numbers are improving as far as like connectivity and, and people who are sort of have access to smartphones and mobile devices. I mean, over the last 10 or 20 years, you see like, you know, huge, really positive trends and movement in that direction. And I think an interesting dimension of this is the way that people, you know, use connectivity. Some some people that you know, will not even, they'll be more consumers than um, producer, you know what I mean? So it's more about like, people will be connected, but they'll be streaming video and things like that. And maybe not even know that they're connected in a way where they can actually be um, leaning in as opposed to leaning back. Cause I think it's something we think about a lot is like, what is the posture of that sort of digital experience? I mean, are you leaning back and watching something and, you know, playing a video game, maybe it's even a little closer to leaning in, <laughs> but this mm -hmm. idea that, you know, there is the potential for some people to just shift their posture and become more involved and realize totally that there are still inequities. But I think that's an interesting dimension. I just wanted to point out that's the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll stay on the topic while we're on it. I'll stay on the topic of, community engagement, you know, I think change, um, change certainly change at the local level. Mayors will say that it's the most personal job in politics. Um, and I think constituents will say, you know, uh, it requires a certain degree of relentlessness and vocal advocacy and activism to really affect change, uh, meaningful change, right? Change with dollars, change is sort of allocating resources. And one elected official told me, you know, it's not enough to be on the list of priorities for us. You want to be one of the top three items. And that's where the advocacy and activism comes in. It's like, how do you actually get an elected official to say that thing is one of my top three and I will get it done and I will get it done now. Um, but I, you know, I look at community engagement and I think um, about the inequities, again, that we had going into the pandemic and that have endured during the pandemic and community engagement. So my, my colleagues at BU, um, Katie Einstein, Max Palmer, and David Glick have studied this uh, issue at length, looking at inequity in the zoning process and look at, looking at inequity in how new housing gets constructed in cities, right? And what do they find? They find that the people that show up to zoning meetings tend to be older white male homeowners, often with a legal background. And they're protecting their asset, and so they're precluding new, new housing and particularly new affordable housing from getting built. And what they've actually been looking at is has the shift to remote citizen engagement um, sort of uh, lessened inequities during the pandemic? I won't speak for them, but the, the, the initial lessons are no, it, it hasn't reduced inequity, that the shift to digital engagement still, um, uh, and the current processes we have still create more space for the most um, vocal and the most privileged to turn up and speak in opposition to things that are uh, really serving the greater good for the community. And so I think there are things about the process of community engagement that, that continue, unfortunately, to be broken. For sure. And you all have touched on this already, but are there ways to use the power of data to, to uh, highlight where we need more targeted investments? Certainly. I mean, I think that I think that it starts with transparency, but it also it is really about that engagement because the data is there. It's just that people aren't using it. And I think, you know, there's there's no real kind of gateway or real invitation in to sort of use it in a mean, meaningful way. And I think also putting a face on it. So, like, you know, I, I just to me, like, I find it really interesting that, you know, someone has this these assets that are available for them to craft insights and amplify new ideas, you know, across social media. It's there and it can happen, but I think you just need to see someone doing that and get inspired. I mean, if it's a little bit more, you know, a little bit more punk and DIY, and then we could put a face on it and we could get inspired by that person who has a message and can, you know, use data to support it. And I also think that the idea of being able to validate the data, because people are questioning everything nowadays. So it's like, you know, drilling down into individual data points and just saying like, yes, that data is real. It's not just a graph on a newspaper article, editorial, this is like, something I can see, I can see the voices and the people and I can sort of, you know, because there is a fabric of, of t experience that supports this data, you know? So, I mean, kind of connecting those things, I think is, is, is a good way to get at some of that. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll point to two examples um, from cities where I think data has been deployed in a way that's really driving meaningful change. One is, is here in Boston. So Boston had something called, it has something called the Streetcaster program. And Streetcaster is actually a, an effort by the city to uh, remedy inequities in the built environment, specifically in relation to maybe the most underappreciated element of infrastructure, which is the sidewalk. Uh, we don't think about sidewalks. I, you know, we're fortunate to have sidewalks in the Northeast. Not every city in the country has sidewalks. Um, certainly not every city has 
sidewalks that are actually um, uh, created and, and maintained by the city itself, but we do here in Boston. So with Streetcaster, the city went out and they manually inspected every single block of sidewalk and they created a score to understand where sidewalk quality was inferior. They over, but, but that created a, a massive list, right? Millions and millions of dollars, far more, far more money than they could ever put into fixing all those sidewalks in a given year with a given capital budget. And so they overlaid that with socio-demographics of the neighborhoods and they overlaid it with transit access to try to understand where their lower rates of car ownership, meaning more people are walking, more people are walking to transit, more people are taking the bus. And they use that to pinpoint and allocate those dollars and prioritize investing in neighborhoods with the worst quality sidewalks that really use them, right, that are high users. At the same time, they tried to actually fix the 311 system because what was happening was wealthier neighborhoods, this is data, wealthier neighborhoods were calling to have the same darn pothole fixed over and over and over again. And they were getting, they were the squeaky wheel, and so they were actually getting all of the attention and all the dollars of those sort of patch remedies. And so they were, the city said, no, we actually have to fix the system. It can't be response time, and we're going back to the same neighborhoods again and again. We actually have, have to be reallocating dollars to permanent upgrades in neighborhoods that see less investment and be more responsive to the neighborhoods that are even less likely to call to fix the problem. So that's one. And the second one I'll say quickly is the city of Milwaukee, also the city of Minneapolis, actually created um, parks master plans that took into account both the quality of parks and the demographics of the neighborhoods surrounding those parks. And so they were, again, scarce dollars, scarce resources, how do you allocate them? They actually were prioritizing both places that had um, sort of inferior quality that were due for upgrades and neighborhoods where they have sort of a higher number of users, lower income users, um, and, and sort of a density of users so that they, they were allocating those dollars in a way that they were having the best and most effective impact and remedying historic inequities. Those are two things that I think tie the data to the dollars. Yeah, yeah. Those that's are amazing. Yeah. Those are two very good points. I see both of those happening in the city of Charlotte, um, you know, the sidewalks and not having the sidewalks. Well, we don't have sidewalks all over Charlotte. So some places do, most older places don't have them. And the people who use the sidewalks are not the ones who have the best sidewalks. So, but the people who call and complain are the people who live in the South end of town or what they call the, the wedge. And those are the individuals who make all the noise. So they get all the, the improvements and they get all of, because they know how to. Um, and it's it, it, it's just, it's amazing. And then the other point that you made again about, um, you know, Milwaukee and uh, I mean, it, it's true here. And it's just, it's amazing. Just like zoning um, here with zoning, if you don't, you see the yellow sign, but by the time you see the yellow sign go up or they put a sign announcing it, it's probably too late, you know, um, where other places, the developers are meeting with the residents to find out what they want and what type of changes and effectuating those changes based on what the citizens are saying. But here they're not doing that. And so you're right. Um, they get on and complain or they send a letter to city council or to whoever the zoning and they send all those, you know, requests electronically. Um, through the internet, using that social media to do that. And then the other people aren't here when they have meetings, they're, you know, in the middle of the day when they're at work because they have to be at work. So the inequities are still there. Um, the data, I just, I'm at a loss, <laughs> really. I know that's what you do, Christian, for the data. And if we can just translate that and somehow and bring it down to the people who are less who are more impacted by the lack of data would be a great. We have to figure out how to do that and how to make it correlate. That all resonates with me. I feel like my work is a lot of uh, turning data into stories um, and uh, you know highlighting how that actually affects people's lives. And when it comes to things like sidewalks and, and green space, that's something I've reported on too, um, how important sidewalks are for mobility, especially for folks with disabilities. And in the winter time when there's inclement weather, which we're seeing a lot more of um, recently um, and uh, you know, places like parks being important refuges when, you know, we have uh, really bad heat waves like we've seen this summer. Um, 
although those places aren't always, uh, you know, accessible and, and equitable. And I, I think on top of all of those issues, uh, the pandemic has also made us rethink how we use public spaces um, and how we're allocating all of the public realm. So I'd love to talk about how, you know, how can we ensure more equity and access to things like um, parks and green spaces um, um, and sidewalks even. Well, <clears throat> there's an aspect of this that I think that we're really interested in. And, you know, it's really, you know, when we talk about digital experience, we want to reduce friction and we want to make this inclusive. I mean, those are drivers that we always go after. And it really, it is really part and parcel of the way we design things. We go from a human centered design approach. So you want to understand the need and how to connect with people in the most effective way. And that's really, in, you know, and one of the things that we're getting at with some of our new design thinking is like really embedding these things into the environment itself. So when we want to talk about sidewalks, can we look at a sidewalk? And, and get an insight related to that site. You know, so the data isn't so, so much of an abstraction. It's not the planner view. It's the view from inside that I can start getting these insights. And I really think that, you know, distributing them, it maybe it doesn't even require connectivity. I mean, we talk about ways of, you know, integrating these, you know, these data dashboards and views and insights into the environment itself. I think there's a lot of options there, you know, and, and that's, you know, I just, we're just trying to be creative about that and just really kind of opening it up transparency, because I think it is a lot of, a lot of these things are transparency. I mean, you know, we've seen some alarming trends and, you know, in, in San Francisco, gentrification is un unbelievable. I mean, the median house price is completely unaffordable. It's broken. Housing is broken in San Francisco. You know what I mean? And it's so, it's so interesting that, you know, there's data that just is a very simple story, a couple layers of data, and you could see these trends that are alarming and and anyone could see them and also anyone could see the way that zoning has been sort of disproportionately uh it has an agenda that doesn't support all people and that's i mean it's something it's also a very clear trend that goes back for 50 more years that you see the way that zoning's been and, and not everyone knows that story not everyone has that at their fingertips well we all have it at our fingertips we just don't know how how to access it and we don't know that we need to or that maybe we should be looking at it so those are some things that we we've been thinking. I know there's a lot there, but I, it, I'm excited about the topic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think I because I was talking about sidewalks and parks. I'll 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 move on to trees. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that's just, I use that as an example because it's one area where there's been get there's been a lot of media coverage on the relationship between things like tree canopy and, and historic redlining. Right. And then and then we know scientifically we know that there's a relationship between things like tree canopy and air quality. And air quality is one of those issues that we know there's tremendous inequity. Um, it's becoming a pro more prominent issue as, you know, I was telling you guys before this all started, um, we were hit with the smoke from the forest fires even here in Boston, even though we're, you know, miles and miles away from them. Um, uh, trees can't solve that problem, but they are an important part of improving air quality in cities. And so when you have, when you look at a map and you look at neighborhoods, historically neighborhoods of color and lower income neighborhoods, you see far less tree canopy. Um, but mapping that is really expensive. And I think one of the things that has been exciting is seeing new resources that are coming out that are really national. And so I'm, gonna, I'm pointing to one, I just looked it up to share with everybody, the American Forests, if you haven't looked at it, has a new tool out that actually maps tree canopy for cities all across the country. And you can drill down into your own neighborhood if you actually wanna see. And then it looks at not just where are the trees, but what are the actual benefits or the benefits you're missing out on if you don't have that tree canopy. And I think things like that, where there's a third party, they make that investment, but it's a, a national resource that also has local relevance for residents who want to um, uh, advocate for improvements to things like tree canopy, then there's actually these tools and resources at their disposal that they don't have to be this sort of data whizzes um, or work with academic experts, they can go to that. I think this, you know, the second thing is even the Trust for Public Land has new um, measures of park. They've always had measures of park access. Now they have measures of park equity to try to understand park acreage um, and park quality and investment um, by different neighborhoods and within different cities. And so again, those are the kinds of things. Someone's done the work for you, but if you're a local resident working at a local level in an individual city, you can tap into resources like that. And that helps you make the case for why your city or your neighborhood needs greater investment and greater resources. Yeah. 
Definitely. You um, pointed out a couple of different things. The tree canopy, um, if you notice in areas where there's predominantly people of color, um, there's generally no tree canopy or very little. And yet if you go into a neighborhood that has a tree canopy, if you're, you know, transitioning from one to the other, you can noticeably feel how much cooler it is where there's somewhere that has a tree canopy and somewhere that doesn't, um, just like parks and things like that. So in Charlotte, they have this, we want to make sure we have a park, I think within that two miles or a mile of everyone's home, there's a park that you can go to. And so what they call a park for some people may be a park with a couple of benches on it and maybe a basketball hoop a court and that'll be it for the park. And then you go to another park in another part of town and they have all kinds of amenities in that park. And it's just so amazing. Those are the kind of things that you can say, well, we have a park here and they have a park within a mile of their house that they can go to, but the inequities in the park, they just did a study here where they went around to all the parks and the parks that were in the worst conditions were all in areas of people of color, you know, but then they put tons of work into other parks. But the people who are complaining about the parks are, again, the people who are in the wealthier areas because they utilize the parks more. But do you think they utilize the parks more because they're nicer parks? Do you think other people wouldn't want to utilize the park close to their area, but it's just not something that's um, it's appealing to go to? So it's just all those kind of things that, you, that, that are out there that you just don't realize um, unless you know um, in a lot of areas where people of color, especially because of redlining, the type of zoning for the the houses or the areas like, and there's a neighborhood where we are here, and basically the whole neighborhood is considered like I-1 land, which is industrial land, but it's residential. Mm -hmm. So there's houses built on I-1 land, you know, so it used to be industrial or they built industrial next to houses because they didn't care and nobody complained and said anything. So the data is there. But how do you get that data out to say, well, this is here, because one of the things that the city, don't get me wrong, city, I love you, city of Charlotte, but one of the things is they don't want to change some of those industrial zones because they're thinking, oh, then the businesses are going to have to leave. So we want to keep these still as some industrial zone, although there's residents right next to it. So how do you make those adjustments? How do you take the data and make that say, well, no, we need to change this and make it actually happen? Yeah, we actually uh, just uh, published a video on um, the urban heat island effect and how and why some neighborhoods are significantly hotter than others. It's on the Verge Science YouTube channel. But we went out with thermal cameras in East Harlem and the Upper East Side to see a pretty dramatic difference in temperatures um, from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, so there's there's definitely a lot to um, dig into there and so much that can be done around changing physical infrastructure um, to prevent heat related illness and prevent heat related death and and uh, make it so that you don't have one neighborhood that is suffering much worse temperatures um, and health effects as a result. Um, you know, with that said, um, I, I did want to talk about whether, um, you know, we, we are spending enough time looking through different lenses, knowing that, you know, the, the same strategies don't necessarily work for all communities. Um, you know, how do we do, do that better um, and, and be more inclusive of, of community voices, um, you know, that differ from, from community to community? I think this is, touches on a lot of the civic engagement that we've talked on before. But yeah, I mean, um, the strategies are, are there's no one size fit all, fits all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, one example I, that comes to mind for me, I, I think everyone is trying to solve this right now. I don't think, I don't know of a lot of great evidence, at least, or even really great examples from cities. I think one, one, one sort of older example that comes to mind for me was a number of years ago, the city of Toronto the head planner for the city of Toronto recognized inequity in engagement around zoning decisions. And she said, okay, we're gonna completely change how we engage citizen engage, like completely change how we change, we're gonna completely change citizen engagement in relation to zoning decisions. And they did a, uh, essentially a lottery and broke down the demographics of the city, you know, the age, different racial and ethnic groups, different religious groups in Toronto, and just by lottery sent invitations to different residents saying, would you like to be part of a community advisory group around zoning decisions in the city of Toronto? And people responded and they applied, but it was, a, it was a random process, right? It was trying to get people who would never otherwise be engaged in the city. 
And so they applied and then they went through essentially like a citizen boot camp to figure out what is zoning, how are decisions, you know, what are the things that we have to worry about, who, what agency does what. Um, and then through that process, they actually came to, um, they became the sort of expert advisory council that was guiding the city rather than just the resident groups with the most vocal people with the most time to kind of show up and harangue elected officials. So that's one example. And I guess the second example would be participatory budgeting, um, you know, which is not a panacea, but a lot of cities across the country have been using New York, you know, just in New York, um, city councilors in New York often use it to say, here's a pot of money and let me actually turn this pot of money back over to my constituents and they come up with the ideas they scope those ideas and they vote on those ideas and those are the investments and in boston we have a about a million dollars in capital budget it's a program called youth lead the change and it's youth driven participatory budgeting the young people come up with the ideas scope the ideas come up with the ballot and vote on the initiatives and it's a million dollars of the city's capital budget um, that they vote on every year that's amazing. Uh, we're doing a lot to engage kids because we think it start, you know, starts by like reframing attitudes towards these things and like understanding wh what's possible and starting with a simple story and kind of deepening that understanding. But I think just the hooks from the very beginning we're interested in. There's a museum exhibit that we're designing, which is Sustainable Cities, which is really gives kids the opportunity to adopt a section of city and it's a projection map. It's high tech city. It's mechanized projection map but the kids can make decisions. Like one of the decisions is the building mix. So it's a very simple idea of zoning. So what is the mix? How do you combine your building mix? And as you do it, you watch your city transform and change and you and you see the impacts of some of those decisions because everything's a trade off in a way. And you can also adjust your green space mix. So if you turn up your green space, some buildings drop and turn into parks. I mean, it's all fantasy, but the idea is that kids realize that, yeah, I can make, I can shape my city. You know what I mean? This is something that's totally possible. And all these decisions are being made by somebody. In the future, that could be me. Just even just that realization that, you know, somebody's making these decisions, that all of this is possible. You know, you can, and you can sort of have some agency in your own community and maybe, you know, get involved in these ways. And it's just, it's really one-on-one stuff. I mean, but it, I think it's also valuable just to kind of get that reframe some of this stuff. So it's not just like a world that I've inherited, but a world that, I can impact, you know, I think there's, there's something there. That's great. Um, I also, you know, I, I really want to hear Melissa's take on this as well, but want to um, quickly open it up to any questions. Um, if folks want to submit, um, we'll continue the conversation um, with, uh, you know, any questions you want answered from our panelists, you can drop them in the chat. Um, but Melissa, did you want to uh, add on? I have a lot to say, I don't know. <laughs> um, That's great. Yeah. Let me get my thoughts together. <laughs> yeah. Let me get them together. Um, I just think that what's, I think that's important. Um, what Christian said um, was very important. I love the ideas. I love the ideas um, that everybody has. I just don't know how how do you turn those ideas? So as an example, um, we had a, a, a project, um, the Smart Cities Engagement, where we worked with the city and our community and we said, okay, here's some money. We have these, we call them kickstarts, not projects. We call them kickstarts. And they said, okay, here's the kickstarts. You determine from the community what you need and what you want in the community. And the and I think there were four overall that were that were um, suggested by the or by the community, maybe five, but there were four suggested by the community. But then there was one that wasn't suggested by the community, but they just said, okay, we're gonna do this one too. We're gonna throw it in there. And that was the one that was least successful. So to me, what that says is if you're inviting the community and you get the community, the community behind and they're the ones giving the ideas and um, how the impacts and what they're looking for, that you'll be successful in that. So somehow we have to turn this in to say, yes, um, if you have the community behind it and the community is able to provide their input. And I love that idea where they were and people were invited to come and join this committee and they did and they did. And then they became the advisory group 
to the to the rest of the community or to the other groups. That's that's so important because people are thinking, oh, this is important for me. You know, I had an impact in this, and people want to feel valued, so they want to feel that, and because they want to feel valued, um, then they're willing to be engaged in it and they're willing to share what they learn. So it's not just certain groups of people that are able to to impact change. That everybody can impact change because you have the opportunity because you were asked and you were included in the process. So I think those are all things that the cities that we all are in and the areas that we all work in, we all just need to go back. And I, I said it again, I'm trenches on the ground. So I'm not at the high level with the all the other stuff. I'm like right there in the ground where it's happening, talking to the people, talking to the residents, being in their face, but not in a negative way, but being in their face and talking to them just to get their ideas and get it out and to be able to share that. And that's just so important because I think no matter what happens to be really effective in any type of change, you're gonna have to engage the community. Don't just come to a group and say, hey, this is what we think you want. No, what do you want? Tell us what you want and let us determine how we can do that for you. You know, like. How do you want that done? What what does this look like to you? And really ask, and don't just ask and not do it, but ask and help them, give them the resources to do what they need to do to get done what needs to be done for their communities. I love that. Um, it's such a great um, melding of, of data and being in the, the trenches that we've gotten to, to, to have today. Um, thank you so much for all of your insights. Um, and I'm, uh, excited to see all of this work move forward. Uh, before closing out, uh, I did want to uh, introduce Lillian Cor Corral, uh, the Director of National Strategy um, and Technology Innovation at Knight Foundation with some, some closing thoughts for us. Great. Thanks, Justine. Um, and thank you to the panel. Um, I think a lot of the comments share really bring back the point around uh, using data to really understand inequity, and I've heard Catherine really talk about this. You know, how does we? I think we can take for granted that it's really clear what inequity looks like in our community, um, and at the same time, if we really want to try and solve a lot of these inequities, we really do need more of this data at our fingers at our fingertips. So there's a lot more that seems like we need to be able to do, and it sounds like. The engagement piece is still a nut to crack. And so thank you to Melissa and the team um, uh, in Charlotte and then Christian at Gensler for really um, pushing on the bounds of how we make data more accessible. How do we really engage the public in this discussion? Um, to close out, I just wanted to give some last minute um, instructions. If you're still with us, um, thank you so much for finishing up day one um, of the Smart Cities Lab 2021. Um, and, and, you know, as a team member here at Knight Foundation, we're so um, grateful to be able to be in conversation with you all. If you are interested in learning more about the grantees um, that are in the uh, on the Hopin platform and beyond, um, we now invite you to visit the Expo Hall. Um, you can find the icon on the left side of your browser, or if you're on your mobile device, you'll see it at the bottom. Um, and if you click on the Expo Hall, you'll be able to actually go into various sessions, see grantees. They are um, virtual booths. If if you will, that are being hosted by individuals who are running uh, programs and initiatives across um, the night, uh, smart cities portfolio. And when you click on the booths, um, you'll see a video or some present or Google slide presentations, and you'll be able to interact with them and ask questions, hopefully exchange information, and perhaps you know pick up some ideas for your community along the way. Um, please uh, uh, join us tomorrow for day two, just a sneak preview of what's happening. Um, in the morning, we'll be kicked off by Kelly Jin, who is our Vice President of Community and National Initiatives, um, who's going to kick off a day that's really a bit more forward-looking. We're going to tackle the issue of mobility um, and equity, and we're also going to talk a little bit more about autonomy. Um, we're going to uh, delve deeper into uh, one of Knight's initiatives um, around autonomous vehicles and autonomy, uh, autonomous devices, and really look at how the public can get engaged with such a sort of forward-looking technology, um, but yet that has a lot of regulatory implications 
today. And so how do we actually do the hard work, um, as Melissa just alluded to, of working on the ground, in the trenches, and actually letting community have a voice in all of that? And then we'll also, um, for grantees, have a session from Panthea Lee around strategy and impact. And how do we keep our eye on um, impact when there is so much variability and so much ambiguity in the world around us? So please join us tomorrow. And right now, I invite you to um, you know, go through our expo hall and meet others. Thanks so much for joining us today.